Good evening, everyone. We're back once again at the Real Science Exchange Pub, where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Tonight, we have a big topic teed up, and we're going to be looking at the, the mega trends impacting agriculture around the world. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, and I'll be one of your hosts tonight at the Real Science Exchange. I'm joined at the pub tonight by Brett Stewart from Global Agritrends. Welcome to our virtual pub, Brett. Now, I understand you're a teetotaler, which is something my wife aspires me to be. But, uh, yeah, the lovely Mary has not, not accomplished her task yet. So tonight I'm enjoying a, a generous pour of Buffalo Trace tonight. So, um, yeah, what's in your glass? So, yeah, I've got a I've got a. A and W root beer on ice. <laughs> I'm yeah. a pretty cheap date for this. fine vintage. Yes, nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, Brett, you, you do this for a living. Um, you know, you 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 predict the future, if you will. So That's how you explained it in the, the webinar. Tell us a little bit about your company, uh, Global Agra Trends, and tell us um, tell the audience a little bit about how they might be able to contact you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, so uh, we started this company in 2006 uh, with the focus and drive to just really be able to keep a finger on the pulse of the global agriculture markets. We do uh, market research, uh, policy analysis, forecasting, and uh, really just try to distill everything, all the noise ways around the world into some concise, clear, actionable information for our users. And we have a very wide subscription base from bankers to hog farmers to cattle feeders uh, to meat importers in Asia to around the world. Basically, anyone who's trying to keep a finger on the pulse of the global markets. And our focus is in proteins and grains, so beef, pork, poultry, and, and the grains markets as well, also a little bit in the dairy markets. And so that's what we do. The The best way to, to see what we're up to, you can go to our website, globalagritrends.com. It's A-G-R-I-T-R-E-N-D-S.com, Global Agritrends. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Agritrends. But that'd be the best way to to see what we're up to. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Now, you joined us uh, back in December, I think it was, for the Real Science Lecture Series. And you were talking about uh, global trends in agriculture. Now that a few months have passed and we're well into 2021, has anything changed or anything that surprised you in the short term? Uh, it changes every week, Scott. I mean, we, we just uh, scratch our head at the, the speed and, and uh, mobility of these markets. It, it's incredible. And more and more, our markets have become global. And that's been a, a process over decades. Um, but with the speed and flow of information, with the increased ability through technological advance, we can ship chilled pork to Japan. We can ship uh, meat all over the world. And these markets trade in real time, 24 hours a day around the world. And so as, as things move, it affects our markets quickly. And so, yeah, uh, since, since we talked, there have been a lot of things change. Um, and today we can talk a big mega trends, the overriding trends long term. We can also talk some about the short term trends and what we're seeing out of China. China has now, I guess, one of the things, and it's it was kind of going when we talked on the the real science uh, series, but uh, China is absolutely the global market driver today of beef, pork, poultry, soybeans, and corn. And they're playing pretty heavily into the canola markets, the wheat markets, uh, the sorghum markets around the world as well. And uh, China's always been that question mark out there, but it's for real now. I mean, their, their activity in the markets has become significant. Mm. Looking forward to uh, digging into that in just a little bit. Um, I see you've brought a guest with us tonight. Would you mind uh, introducing him? You bet. I've got my business partner here, co-founder of Global Agritrends, Richard Fritz, a man with uh, deep, extensive experience in the industry and 
I, I would never have ventured down the road of this business had I not crossed paths with Richard years ago. Um, Richard has worked in uh, throughout agriculture. He's worked uh, on the Hill in D.C. He can tell you a little more about this. He was uh, the uh, director of agriculture for the state of Oregon. He's done private consulting and other capacities as well in the agriculture markets. And uh, is if you want if you want restaurant or travel advice on any country that you or I can name, he's the guy to call. I remember I don't know how many years it was, but he mentioned to me. He said, "I'm going somewhere," and he goes, "I've I've hit my 100th country," and I don't know a lot of people who have traveled to more than 100 <laughs> countries, and I don't know anyone who's done it from an agriculture background perspective. He's conducted on the ground agriculture research and analysis on on six continents uh, we haven't got him to antarctica yet but uh, but outside of that he's been all over the world and so he just brings the great wealth of experience and knowledge to our business and to this discussion today mm-hmm. oh that's excellent Richard, would you mind to kind of give us some background on that, uh, the, the, the research that you've been doing in the 100 countries, and then maybe just a little bit of maybe the, the wine tasting you've done there as well? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. The, the first thing I should say is, uh, although Germany can't be exporting pork anymore, they're still exporting good beer. So that's what I'm having uh, this afternoon. Well, as Brett mentioned, my... Um, Experience has been both in the uh, public and private sector, um, uh, both at the federal level, uh, working at uh, Capitol Hill and USDA, as well as uh, in state governments, but have spent most of my time in the consulting field uh, doing market research uh, for the proteins, uh, mostly livestock and poultry, uh, and a lot in the food safety sector around the world. And uh, in that case, it was either the private clients producing those products or the foreign governments that were looking to uh, improve their own production and their own food safety. Um, as Brett said, I've worked around the world, um, both in highly developed countries and uh, in some pretty rough areas in uh, in Central Africa and uh, also the emerging markets in Asia. And I um, um, don't want to give, my, give away my age, but I started visiting Southern China in the late seventies. And that's when places like Guangzhou were nothing but an open rice field. So um, seeing it from the late 70s to today has been an astounding journey, to say the least. I just have a quick comment. I forgot something. And I know I know Richard's a little bashful about this, but but uh, one of the key experience points that I left out was uh, Richard was appointed to the USDA under Secretary Glickman back in the 90s and spent some years there as the, I think, the number three office at mm-hmm. USDA. And so he administered the Foreign Agriculture Service for the agency and uh, administered the Commodity Credit Corporation and uh, had some great experience there as well. Oh, that's excellent. Really uh, looking forward, uh, Richard, to getting to know you better tonight and uh, having a conversation with you. Um My co-host tonight is Jonathan Griffin. Jonathan is the vice president of Balchem's animal nutrition and health business. Jonathan, this is your second time here, so welcome back. Glad to have you back. Um, First of all, what's in your glass tonight? And then tell us a little bit about uh, the challenges that, uh, as a business leader, that you've faced in 2020. And then what kind of opportunities do you see coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, thanks, Scott. And I'm having a nice glass of uh, Merlot this evening. So yeah, glad to be back here on the uh, on the Real Science Exchange. The last year w- was certainly challenging. I was thinking of Richard's comment about all the countries he's visited, and I thought to myself, I'm not sure if I've even travel- traveled six kilometers outside of my house within the last year. So <laughs> I can't I can't wait to get back out on the road and actually see the world. So, um, but um, you know, in all seriousness. It it uh, it certainly has been a you know has been an interesting uh, past 12, 12, 13 months here. 
as, as a matter of fact, I, can, I was thinking, preparing for this call, I believe it was about exactly a year ago when we first uh, got the call uh, within Balkim uh, that we were having some issues. We have a manufacturing plant in the Lombardy region of, of Italy, in northern Italy, mm-hmm. which was essentially ground zero for the, the European uh, outbreak after China. And uh, for our business, we certainly went into to crisis mode from there and, and certainly keeping a priority on our employees and on our facilities. You, you know, we um, really took a, a very concentra- uh, concentrated approach to manage the situation, ensure that, as I said, certainly number one priority was our employees and our, and our team members. Mm-hmm. But then secondly, it was ensuring that we we stabilize the, the supply chain and the operations so that our customers could continue to get the the nutrients in the in the supplies for their operations that would allow them to keep feeding the animals of, of Europe and eventually the world. So it was a it was an all hands on deck uh, effort by everyone in our organization and and I uh, was very uh, very pleased and proud of the, of the way that our entire organization came through it. Um, you know, we, as a, as a company, we have approximately 1400 employees. We certainly were impacted. We've, we've had unfortunately some employees that, that were impacted by COVID, but we were able to, to navigate it. And, uh, and luckily everybody is, is recovering and doing well. So from our personal perspective, that was a, a big challenge within the within the last year. And it's, it's really put a, for me personally and for our company, a real focus on, on what uh, Brett talked about, you know, the, the global fishbowl that we live in, especially within the ag industry. So it's really put that in a much sharper, sharper image. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Brett, back in December when you uh, presented on the lecture series, you talked about four primary megatrends. Would you mind giving us kind of a macro view of what those four megatrends were that you discussed at that time? Yeah, sure. So uh, the four megatrends were, these are big picture, right? This is the big fuel for the engine of global agriculture. And the first two are pretty simple. It's global population. The population's rising at 73 million per year. And uh, that provides pretty good fundamental demand for global agriculture. So we've got population, we've got rising income. And we did some research into the relationship between GDP and global consumption of proteins. And uh, over 40 years, it's a 0.99 R square. The fit, the correlation is uncanny. More money, more protein. And that's on a worldwide basis. And so more money is significant. We look at what's happened in China with the, with the increase in wealth, the increase in economy. But not just China, around the world, the developing world is moving up the ladder and uh, has had a major impact on global protein markets. So the first was population, the second was income, the third was China, just China on its own, how it has changed. And like I said, even in the last two months, that focus has become much sharper, China's influence on our global commodity markets. The fourth was a little different. It was the impact of the wealthy 3%. And I talked about the wealthy 3%, not, uh, not of the U.S., the wealthy 3% of the world. And what we really talked about there was the activism and the push to not just promote um, yield-reducing practices such as u- organic or free-range or natural or non-antibiotic fill-in-the-blank, but actually the move to legislate those practices and what that potentially could do, particularly to the world's poor. And uh, I've, I've often said I have no problem with, with fake meat, with organic milk, fill in the blank, no problem at all, until they legislate it and take conventional agriculture out of the dairy case, out of the meat case. Then we have real problems, particularly for the world's poor. Those were the those were the four megatrends that we talked about in the series. Yeah, just kind of following up on you, you were talking a little bit about how the ethanol legislation impacted people. And maybe you can expound on that. I mean, it's just one of those uh, unintended consequences, right? Yeah, that was that was an interesting thing. And I spent some time this week actually going back over ethanol policy and looking at what happened. And anybody in the in the grain markets or the livestock markets. Remembers when corn went to eight dollars a bushel, 
that was that was drought driven, but it was also ethanol driven. We had the mandate that took as much as 40% of our corn crop into the ethanol markets. Then we had some drought in 2011 and 12. Corn prices go through the roof. And it was interesting. So, so here's just some some rough math. So corn prices go from $3 a bushel, $2 a bushel, jump up to $8 a bushel. For U.S. consumers, most consumers would never have known that happened. And I know corn, corn is priced as feed corn, right? But if we just take that price and apply it to, let's say, corn flakes, to food corn, the amount of corn in a box of corn flakes, when that price hike increased, it raised the cost of a box of corn flakes less than 15 cents a box. And so that $3.70 box of corn flakes went to three eighty five. dollars Now in Haiti, where they live on cornmeal, it drove them to destitution. We had, I remember a news report uh, that there were Haitians that were actually mixing lard with fine clay and making little dirt cakes because they absolutely could not afford cornmeal at those prices. And so food inflation is interesting. In the U.S., we can see all these commodity prices rising. The average consumer probably won't notice much of this. And it's the same if we were to legislate that GMOs could never be produced again, something like that. That might be a little more noticeable in the U.S., but boy, in the third world, it is absolutely crippling when that happens. Well, can I jump in there as well? Sure. Um, um, I've seen this in, in other countries where GMOs are prohibited. And in Zimbabwe, if you remember about a decade ago, they even turned away U.S. food aid because it had GMO content in it. So it's not just the legislation in the U.S. or the the richer countries like Europe, you know, the countries of Europe and the U.S., but that has impacted a lot of production uh, and uh, food insecurity in Africa. And now as feed prices are going up um, and shortages are occurring, and many countries in Africa still are not approved to GMOs for either production or consumption, they're going to get hit harder again than us in the richer Western countries are going to experience. So is this on the radar of anybody that can make a difference? That What can we do, I guess, to kind of turn the tide here? I, I wish I had an answer to that and say, yes, it is on the radar of certain people and we could turn the tide. But unfortunately, it's not. It is when it comes to non-food products like cotton, let's say, but when it comes to a staple like corn um, in in places like Africa, corn is corn, you know, maize is maize. It doesn't matter. There's no distinction in most cases from a feed corn versus a human corn. So um, people are just uh, not focused on changing the policies right now because either they're profiting from it or they don't understand the science of it. Hmm. Very well. And I, I think that's true in the Caribbean as well. So hmm. I think one thing, yeah, what do we do, right? And it's a big issue. I think the one thing that we need to do as an industry in agriculture is fight legislation. And uh, like I say, there's no problem with these other products, and and most of them are yield-reducing practices. There's no problem with that GMO-free soybean meal, whatever, tofu, I don't care, whatever it is. That's okay to have in the marketplace as long as we allow choice and allow conventional agriculture. Because while, while every Hollywood celebrity, it seems like, will praise the benefits of, of these yield reducing practices, these different products, the loudest voice in the world defends conventional agriculture. And that voice is price. And as long as we can keep legislation out of this, and those products have to compete on a, on a flat playing field, they can be in the market, they've got to carry their own weight. If they're more expensive, you can't legislate costs on the livestock industry to make those products more competitive. Um, just leave it, let, we got to ensure a flat playing field so that conventional agriculture can still be there because price conscious customers, not just in the U S but around the world 
absolutely need it. And so that's my, my mantra is it's, 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 it's this, it's socially irresponsible to legislate yield reducing practices. Now that doesn't solve the world problem, right? But right. that's about all we can do here. Go but ahead. Brad, I, I think we've stepped away from that as a U.S. entity. I mean, um, let's face it. Uh, in my time in government, in the federal government, producers and associations tended to focus on USDA and USDA only, maybe USTR when it came to trade issues. But unless you were in um, the animal health field, you never talk to FDA. You never talk to commerce, which controls uh, the, the seafood markets. You never talk to those setting standards, per se. Um, you, you didn't talk to a lot of the other parts of government, domestically and internationally, that had an impact on what you were doing. And if you look at what has happened in the past you know, five, six, seven years. China is now chair of the FAO in Rome. Europe is driving all of the codex standards that we have today, along with the WHO, which sets food safety, maximum residue levels in foods and, and animal drugs and in feed. So we have kind of stepped away from that and not really exerted the power that we could have to help ameliorate some of those laws and regulations um, that is hampering agricultural trade and production in most of the world. You know, kind of wonder we're on the subject of, uh, you know, feeding the hungry. Brett, I, I remember in your presentation, you, you, you showed the, the map and where, you know, 50 percent of the world population lived in, in a very small circle that you had drawn on that map. And and yet inside that map, there was uh, very little productive land. Um, but and you talked a little bit about um, the need to export our technology to these regions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? and the need for that and how we're going to do that perhaps. Yeah, so the, so the map that Scott's describing here, it was it was just a a globe of the earth with a circle and inside that circle you include India to Japan, China down to Indonesia. If you draw a circle around India, Japan, Korea, China, Indonesia, um, the Philippines, basically that circle. Uh, the, the comment was there are more people inside of that circle than there are outside of that circle. And when you look at that circle for any good arable land, you've got the Himalayas, you've got the Gobi Desert, you've got a lot of ocean. You just have limited arable resources. And so what's happened, and it's been a major driver the last 10 years, is Asia is ramping up agriculture imports. They simply cannot produce what they need there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're seeing a lot more backhauls across the Pacific going west in food exports into Asia. Now, now the concern is when you talk about uh, uh, poverty and food insecurity worldwide, uh, you know, I showed, I also showed the population chart, world population from 5,000 BC, which starts at a very low baseline mm. and then goes straight up to seven and a half billion today. A lot of people see that. And my comment was the question is, we're all going to die, right? Mm -hmm. There's no way we can survive this. And, and the joke is, yeah, spoiler alert, we are all going to die, but we're not going to die of starvation. And the opportunity is to what you said, improving technology production practices around the world. And uh, I did a project years ago for a company to look at that and said, can we feed 9 billion people by 2050? Mm -hmm. And we looked at it from the standpoint, what if we have to freeze acreage? What if we have no more acres? What if we have uh, no more resources? We try and do it with the same resources. What was pretty shocking about that? project. And I looked at the proteins, beef, pork, and poultry, but I was also involved in the dairy piece and some of the other pieces. What was interesting is absolutely, we can feed 9 billion people, no problem, as long as we allow productivity growth. And productivity growth means allowing production technologies to flow around the world. Uh, the, the U.S., I think the number was 
the U.S. and Europe produce seventy uh, percent of the world's milk with thirty-seven percent of the world's cows, something like that. And seventy uh, percent of the world's cows live dairy cows live in India and Brazil, and uh, they're just terrible productivity. And so we looked at all those things, the maintenance cost of keeping a cow that's low productive in milk. And boy, the the gains are absolutely shocking through GMOs, through productivity, through compounds, feed additives, all of those things. Boy, if that were to spread worldwide, we would completely collapse our agriculture Mm -hmm. markets. But we have the ability to produce far, far more food than we are now, even if we freeze the, the footprint. Yeah, and, uh, you know, if we could increase land productivity in some of these areas, you look at Mm. China where, you know, land productivity is actually declining in a lot of places along with Mm. water availability and water quality. And then you take a place like Japan where basically the population is changing, is elderly, and uh, you expect production to go down, not up, even in the most sophisticated and, you know, tech-friendly types uh, uh, places within Asia. It will be interesting to see how the, the, the next generations, both the millennials and the Generation Z, mm. view, view technology within agriculture through the lens of sustainability. Mm-hmm. Because if you, if you think through the impacts logically, you can't have one without the other. And the same groups that are oftentimes advocating for taking technology out of the food system are are sometimes the same ones that are are really pushing for a more sustainable future with less Mm. resource intensity. So my hope is that sometime there is a there is a reckoning of of those two unequal sides Mm. to realize there needs to be some logic there. Yeah. That's a great point, Jonathan. It really comes down to just getting good information. Good information will drive good decisions. And unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, misconstrued information and biased information. And But just trying to get pure, true information is, uh, is a real challenge today. Is that anything you dig into, uh, Brett, is, is, is communication and uh, educating uh, the audience? Are there any mega trends there that, that, that you follow? I'm just thinking, you know, at Balchem, we're, we're um, obviously a commercial entity, but we also have a role that we can play like this podcast in, you know, being a, an advocate and a mouthpiece for the industry. And I'm just kind of curious um, if you've got any opinions in terms of how do we as an industry get a, a, an informed message out there? Boy, that's a good question. It's uh, For me, it's kind of a soapbox issue, right? And I pull it into that discussion on megatrends. I kind of pull it in that last, that fourth megatrend to discuss it. But uh, it's more of a soapbox issue than just what we commercially do. We are, we are analyzing markets and providing market information. And uh, I don't know, I've thought before, if I didn't have to make a living doing that, it would be a fun cause to take up, to just truly try to work with the right people to get pure information out in a way that is digestible and can reach lots of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that's more of a, more of a media type uh, Mm -hmm. business than what I do, but your thoughts, Fritz. Well, you know, I think the greatest advantage the U S and Canada and some of the other Western countries and even India to some extent had when we started all of this was an extension service, a free extension service, basically from the governments and the universities who were talking to farmers every week about the new innovative changes that were happening And most of the world has lost that. And the research, the amount of money that governments have put into research in the West has gone down, where in countries like China, it's gone way up. But the problem is exactly what you said, communication of the results of that research and showing it on the ground and being able to have farmers see what those advantages are before they take the risk themselves and changing production practices is key. Um, And uh, 
because uh, the research has gone more private, let's say, and the lack of that extension service, I think it makes it extremely difficult to accomplish what you, what you're seeking. You know, better education, better use of technology, and trusting of the technology that's uh, that's come along. Hmm. If, if you guys don't mind, I kind of like to maybe kind of move the spotlight uh, back to maybe China. We had talked mm-hmm. before about the the huge force that they're they're playing, and one of the huge mega trends. What's currently happening um, with China today relative to the Phase One agreement that we have in place? Um, I'll start with that. Mm-hmm. So, so it's interesting. The Phase One agreement uh, when President Trump. Uh, signed the deal with President Xi, the the commitment was, and all of the focus was on these purchase commitments. And President Trump said the Chinese are committed to buy $37.5 billion of U.S. agriculture in this year, which was shocking. I mean, shocking by a huge scale. Um, The most we had ever exported to China was right around 26 billion. And we were way below that the last couple of years. And so there was a lot of focus on that. Now, we just got the January trade data this month or the December trade data. So we just got the final year end tally. We exported 26.4 billion in agriculture to China last year. So far short of the 37 billion and a lot of the news reports were just quick to say, well, the phase one agreement was a total failure. The 26.4 billion was a record. We have never sent 26.4 billion in ag exports to China, but the agreement was much more than purchase commitments. And from the ag side, if you look, it opened the market to us beef. We have not had really hardly any us beef access to China ever. And China has been the biggest beef importer in the world uh, for the last five plus years. And so China banned U.S. beef over BSE, mad cow disease, back in 2003. And even before that, we didn't ship very much. Now, in the interim, China has become a massive global beef vacuum. They are pulling beef from everywhere in the world. And so this phase one agreement gave us a, a deal that we can ship beef to China and not just beef, We can ship all ages. We can ship all products. We can ship bone in, boneless. It's one of the most liberal uh, beef agreements we have outside of North America. And so it was a great deal for that. We're seeing beef shipments to China straight up. I mean, it's going up like a rocket. We've Mm -hmm. been shipping for about six months. Those volumes continue to go higher. It also opened the market to U.S. poultry. U.S. poultry had been banned by China for over four years and we're now shipping 50, 60,000 tons a month of U.S. poultry to China. And so it was far beyond just the purchase commitments. Those were good. But, uh, yeah, the agreement really cracked the door open for some new commodities and new business that we didn't have before. And, and it um, put in place China's commitment to certain uh, sanitary and phytosanitary commitments, which are going to last far longer than the agreement itself. So um, it forced some internal restructuring of their own trade practices and uh, limitations on agricultural products. So um, to me, that was the greatest effect was the changes in what internally they've agreed to. And I have to say, they have followed up on every one of those. Uh, They still have uh, a few more that they're working on, but they have done what they said they were going to do. And uh, I think the long term, you know, is, is very bright because of that agreement. How much of that poll was also, I guess, secondarily the impact of, of the gap that was there because of swine fever? Yeah, good question. So that's really the spark that has lit the fire in China was uh, just a bit of background. In 2000, August 2018, China reported their first case of African swine fever, which is a a swine disease that's 95% fatal. It's a very hardy virus. It's very hard to kill, has no human health issues, but kills swine. And China had half of the world's swine herd at the time. 
No one knows for sure how many pigs there are or were in China. Not me, not you, not anyone. State secret. State secret. And I don't think the state even knows. Mm -hmm. But we estimate that they lost roughly 60% of their swine herd during 2019 as those hogs were killed, cold, and buried and eaten. And uh, so that's what Jonathan's referring to. That created a massive gap. So they have half of the world's swine herd and they lose half their swine. That's 25% of the world's swine herd was gone in 2019. And that created a massive wave of inflation. And so Chinese beef prices went through the roof. Chinese hog prices. Prices are, they're all still through the roof. Beef prices in China just hit a new record high this month. Um, and they have pulled an increase of $18 billion over two years of global protein into China. And so that wave was already going. It's absolutely mm-hmm. staggering how much they have affected the global protein markets. The phase one agreement open beef and poultry, never really ship beef. We didn't have that opportunity or poultry. And so right in this big inflationary wave, that agreement comes and opens beef and poultry. And now uh, the U.S. has now surpassed Brazil as the number one supplier of poultry into China. Uh, Under the new administration, do we see anything changing? What do you think, Fritz? I'll let you take that. Um, We will not see much change in agriculture, in my opinion. Um, uh, The new administration is more focused on uh, technology-related issues, high-tech, human rights, um, bringing uh, allies together to discuss things like the South China Sea, and military endeavors. So um, I expect that they will allow the uh, current trade agreement or phase two to run its course. And then that agreement ends at the end of this year. Um, So I don't see much change. And as mentioned, China is in a, in a buying mode there, you know, we think that that um, pork gap is going to continue for several years. Um, and so there's probably not a real danger by, of allowing the agreement to expire. Um, but the relationship in general, the political relationship is not going to be good. It's certainly not going to be as good as it was under Trump when it was, you know, pretty testy then. Um, But I think we're, from an agricultural standpoint, we're in a very good position because they want and need what we have. So you said you anticipate that the swine uh, exports will continue. So am I to read into that, that we we anticipate uh, African swine fever to still be a problem there going forward? Yeah, absolutely. And and it's hard because so China is now the biggest market driver in five key global commodities. They provide no intel. We don't know slaughter. We don't know production. We don't know weights. We don't know inventories. All we know are prices and and import volumes. That's it. And so we're flying blind in this market. And so that's what we have really sought to do. We have a lot of contacts in China and contacts that trade. And we've just really tried to say what is actually going on. And the market goes up and the market goes down. And uh, just an example, in February, the Chinese hog prices fell sharply. They fell from 36 RMB down to 27 RMB. It's been a huge, sharp drop in the China hog price. Well, the Chinese government comes out and says, our recovery is fantastic. In December, they said, we're 90% recovered. And then they just doubled down on it this week and said, by June, we're going to be fully recovered. But all of our contacts in China are saying African swine fever is undergoing a massive second wave. And these prices are actually falling because farmers are liquidating their swine. And uh, over the last week, a lot of that has come into light that the ASF really is a second wave. And so what that means, the price has come down right now. We may not book a lot here in the next month or so. Um, But what it means is that African swine fever 
problem is far from solved. There's still not a vaccine. China's commercializing a lot of their herd. Before ASF, uh, 85% of their hogs came from farms less than 1,000 head. Now they're building mega farms. Uh, Muyan, a major company in China, has 21 high-rise hog barns in one complex. They're claiming that they're going to have 85,000 sows farrow to finish on one site. Absolutely shocking by anyone's standards. And they're doing it in an environment that is prone to disease. Uh, African swine fevers out there, they now have variants of African swine fever that it looks like have developed from the unlicensed use of unapproved vaccines. Mm. And so they've got other problems. They've got pseudo rabies. They've got PED virus. They've got the PERS virus. And so they've moved a massive amount of their hogs into these big commercial environments where I just don't think they're going to be able to manage the disease risk very well. And so I think it's still a very bumpy road forward. Just what we've learned the last month would suggest that uh, China is going to be a massive buyer at least through 2021 and probably into 2022. And uh, the grains markets are secondary to that. Some policies they made there have have eliminated a huge amount of their feed. So now they're, they're heavily involved in our corn markets, in the uh, soybeans as they always have been, but now they're scouring the world for feed grains as well. I kind of would like to maybe transfer over to Africa, but is our, are there anything that we need to cover on China that we've missed? Well, I don't think so. Go ahead, Fritz. Do you have well, something? Well, just going back to what Brett said a little bit is um, not only is it the loss of hogs, it's loss of the productivity of the hogs as well. You know, their their sow numbers and their sow productivity is is going down or has gone down. And what I worry about in these mega hog facilities and in their poultry facilities is their biosecurity and uh, how well that's really being um, uh, monitored. Um, And if you think just before ASF hit, they had a massive program where they wanted all these hog facilities to be relocated out into rural areas because of water quality issues that they were having from uh, livestock waste. Well, now they're bringing them all back into the cities and concentrating them more than ever before without really taking care of the water quality issues as well. So um, I'm pessimistic on China myself. Uh, I think they have a lot more problems than um, than they know of and that the world knows of. Um, and keep an eye out for the next two weeks because – the Chinese Central Committee and the People's Committee have their meetings in the first two weeks of March. It's really focused on agriculture and agricultural production and rural development. And that'll give us an indication of where they're going for the next two, three, four years on overall production and concerns about um, their internal production and their international demand. I was, I was just going to follow up to that, uh, Fritz. I was curious. Do you think the risk of of disease transmission and, and just the, the overall biosecurity threat is better or worse as China's industry gets larger, professionalizes, moves from those less than thousand sow operations that that Brett talked about into the larger for sure, but but hopefully more professional. And I guess maybe short term, but also longer term. Um, yes, for I think it is getting better for a number of reasons. One is the, the number of backyard producers is declining, right. um, or they're just not seeing the return, so they're moving into other agricultural endeavors. Uh, they've improved their poultry biosecurity as well. Um, they are starting to worry more about the open markets and disease um, uh, transfer. Um, uh, So from that standpoint, they are getting better. Um, The concern I have with that is they're still letting the provinces run all of the 
agricultural programs, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's kind of like COVID in the U.S., right? Every state either maybe follows the recommendations of the feds or they're turning in, you know, vaccination data that may not be quite accurate or looks better than it should. Um, And, uh, you know, I can't speak for Brett, but I think he would agree with me that any numbers coming out of China um, are suspect. (laughs) And, you know, Brett and I have been in parts of China where they oh, we have a we have an ASF lab right now, but you walk in there and the material is still in shrink wrap. You know, (laughs) there's there's people that don't know how to use it or. You know, the, the, the materials that they need to run the equipment is, isn't available. So they have gotten better, but they still have a long way to go. I, I'm sorry for the long answer to your question. Oh, makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Richard, while you've got the the microphone there, uh, let's transfer over to Africa. Can you talk a little bit about food security there? Okay. Um, Well, let me talk about sub-Saharan Africa, excluding the country of South Africa, okay? Um, Food security uh, really depends on your income. That might sound strange, but there, the higher your income, oftentimes you're less food secure. Uh, You know, in the very rural areas of Africa, people are producing their own root crops and maize and, you know, everybody has chickens and, you know, your wealth is basically in the animals that you have. Um, In fact, I just was looking at some data um, the other day where rural chickens, the village chickens, production has gone up 30%, while the commercial layers and broiler industry has gone down significantly because the cost of feed has gone up so much. So if you're living in Lagos and, you you know, you're an apartment, uh, you know, in the the most populous country in Africa, it's going to be more expensive and more difficult to secure your, your food resources. Um, so as a friend of mine says, every day is food insecurity in most of Africa. So, you know, if the price goes up, it goes up and you just have to scramble to, to maintain your, your living standard, no matter what. Um, The other issues that they've had recently have been the the huge locust swarms that have taken out a lot of the feed crop and the the human food crops. But at the same time, I'm more optimistic. uh, Unlike much of the world, South Africa has had great weather. Um, They're having record or um, at least enough maize to export to their neighbors. And oftentimes they even export white corn to Mexico for human consumption. Poultry production is going up for the most part in the, in the local areas. Beef is a livestock that is not fed maize. Um, basically, you know, it's a free roaming um, entity. And for the most part, hogs are too, although the, African swine fever has hit uh, Africa pretty hard as well. Um, so it's it's a mixed bag, to, to say the least. Tell us, I think this is interesting, Fritz. Tell us a little more about the problem with feed costs in China or in Africa. We're not talking about just the recent rise in corn and soybeans, but even a year ago. What is the holdup for those commercial poultry producers and where is their feed supply going? Well, first of all, there's almost no soy produced in Africa. Um, It's very, very limited. So um, uh, soy 
um, is hardly fed at all. It was usually uh, fish meal in place of soybeans uh, for the most part, and fish meal starting to dry up. The problem is that the big users, for the most part, have restricted imports. Uh, you have Nigeria, you know, again, what most populous country, large poultry sector per se compared to anybody else, and they didn't allow any imports of corn whatsoever. Is, is that because of GMO? No, no, it's they're trying to stimulate their own domestic, domestic production. corn production. Hmm. But then we go back to our previous conversation. They don't have the technology, the infrastructure, the knowledge, the storage um, to do that work. And um, so just now, as prices have skyrocketed and the industries, uh, especially dairy and poultry, are, um, are folding, they realize they have to open up the market to some degree. Weren't there some uh, some European countries that were importing GMO-free feed out of Asia, pulling it away from the broiler industry or the egg industry? You mean out of uh, Africa? Sorry, out of Africa. Yes. I mean, um, the Europeans have pulled um, non-GMO product and others because they're organic, because of... Not because it's organic, but because there's a lack of fertilizer and other inputs that, uh, you know, are available to the Africans. Europe has also transformed some of those countries to be European suppliers, especially of fruits and vegetables and flowers. And you can argue that that's great for those countries, but others would argue you're taking some of the most productive land putting up greenhouses for non-GMO consumption uh, within Europe. So, um, you know, if you look at the continent, there's very little trade internationally, and there's even less trade between the African nations themselves. Um, And part of that's transportation, but part of that is they have better markets in the U.S. and in Europe and in the Middle East than they do uh, locally. You mentioned the soil. Is that, I, I've been told by many people that from a, uh, just a pure fertility and soil quality uh, opportunity that parts of Africa are some, some of the best opportunities in the, in the world go looking forward. Would you agree with that? I, I would. In fact, the best soybean land I've ever seen is in Northern Mozambique. It's, it's, and people are putting in soy crops that are doing extremely well. But again, it's where's the market, right? I mean, the market there is basically the local chicken industry. What is also surprising to a lot of people is how much land is just left fallow in uh, Africa. And a lot of this relates to the tribal nature. The chief controls the use of the land and who can um, till the land. And a lot of it just sits idle. A lot of Ghana, for example, one of the more productive countries, you go into southern Ghana and it's just wasteland. Um, So even though it could be very productive, it's just not used. You see that changing? And if so, what, what's going to be uh, the catalyst? I think it will change uh, just because of the huge population growth in Africa. Uh, you know, it's a very, very young population across the board. It's getting wealthier. Um, it is getting better educated and less corrupt, if you will. Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, uh, you're you're seeing better infrastructure starting to develop both socially and um, and in hardened infrastructure, if you will, little little better roadways and railways and things of that nature. So I'm optimistic. Um, you know, Brett accuses me of saying that Africa is the region of the future and always will be. Um, <laughs> But uh, there's a lot of truth to that. But, you know, we're not talking about huge volumes, but we are talking about 
an area that shouldn't be ignored. Gentlemen, I just heard them call last call in my headphones here. <laughs> um, I think this might be a good time to start wrapping it up. You guys, uh, for a living, look into the crystal ball, right? So what should farmers be most concerned about going forward? I'm talking about U.S. farmers. Boy, that's a good question. You know, like Fritz says, uh, we're looking at 2021 over the short term here. Things look pretty good. We've got a situation where the the reality is, in terms of geopolitics, we have a country that has fantastically productive land. Uh, we support technology and productivity. We have rule of law. We have good weather patterns. We have the ability to produce some of the most affordable food on the earth. You know, I track these commodities week in, week out. More often than not, U.S. U.S farm commodities are the cheapest on the planet. We're kind of the China of the world in that we are the low cost agriculture manufacturer of the world. Chinese costs are far higher than our costs in agriculture. So while they're the main producer of the world, we're the main agriculture producer of the world. So U.S. farmers are in a real enviable spot. I think there are risks. And uh, I think looking around the world right now, so China's on fire. China needs corn, they need beans, they need chicken, beef, pork, and that's great for us. We're also seeing some blips in Brazil with their beef herd. We may see Brazilian beef production down the first half of this year. We haven't seen that in well over a decade. Mm -hmm. Australian beef production's down. We're in a spot where we could see these beef markets light up. Um, I would say one of the risks looking at this year and this year into next is probably in monetary policy. We are in a very inflationary time right now, and the Fed can say whatever they want. I listened to, to Chairman Powell's comments as he was grilled by the Senate here this last week that inflation's not a concern. He's far more worried about high unemployment. But, uh, boy, we've been tracking not just agriculture, commodities, real estate, stock market, fill in the blank, every. Everything is on fire. And we have put, we've expanded the monetary base through borrowing, through low interest rates, through stimulus, and we have poured gas on this fire. The only way to control, really effectively control inflation is with interest rate adjustments. And that should make our farmers a little nervous. I think for the U.S. farm sector, this will be a good year to get debt under control, to try and pay down debt and protect against possible interest rate hikes. I don't think it's going to run away with us. I don't think we're going to see crazy inflation, maybe like we did in the, in the seventies, eighties, but uh, I think rates are going to be crept higher and it may even happen as soon as the back half of this year, just as inflation continues to heat up. Um, I don't know. That would be one thing I would think about for the U S farmers this year is, is, get debt under control, make some money here and protect against interest rates. Would that be a different answer for uh, other farmers around the world? I think so. I guess we'd have to look country by country. You know, we could look at the European swine sector. There are major competitors in the pork markets and uh, they have a whole host of different issues than we do. They're further down the road of, of animal welfare legislation. Some of those things, I think they are, increasingly uh, seeing higher risk of feed grain supplies in Europe because of their GMO policies. They are cutting off one of their main products. Even in countries like Denmark, that was historically a major pork producer, uh, I think we will see the Danish swine herd decline over the next five years due to policy, due to regulation. They're now fighting African swine fever in Germany. Germany's out of the global markets. They've got biosecurity issues here. Um, yeah, I think there's a whole host of issues. As I look around the world, whether it's Brazil or Europe or Asia or here, I would not want to be a farmer anywhere except in America. Mm -hmm. I think the future is far brighter for U.S. farmers than it is for farmers in other parts of the world today. I, I would agree with all that, Brett. Uh, what I am look at, uh, not this year, not next year, but in the future uh, beyond that uh, is farmers are going to be either forced or willing to look at their carbon offset situations, mm -hmm. you know, the, the current administration. And I think customers across the board, whether they're 
the big processors or the person going to the Safeway, you know, retail shops, they're all starting to look at what is your carbon imprint today. I mean, we've talked about it for decades. I think now things are starting to become uh, more serious in terms of implementation. The other thing that would concern me is, yes, high prices are great right now, but you're going to stimulate more production, uh, especially in Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, maybe parts of South America. There's going to be more competition and there's going to be more pressure to reduce the U.S. government payments to the agricultural industry uh, as prices go up and as um, more budget pressures come forward. Excellent. Gentlemen, um, listen, I want to thank both of you for uh, joining us here this evening. It's been very enjoyable. So I'd like to lift my glass to both of you and thank you. Cheers. (laughs) All right. Are you picking up the tab? Thank you. Yeah. I think that's that's what we brought Jonathan with us. He's, oh, okay. He pays the tab. <laughs> Another round, please. Yeah, yeah. He's budget authorization, huh? Great. He usually ducks out before this, uh, but uh, tonight we got him. <laughs> nice to so, you. So, yeah, thank you for coming. And I'd also like to thank our uh, loyal listeners for stopping by once again to uh, spend some time with us here at the Real Science Exchange. On your way out, uh, please drop us a five-star rating and, and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so that you'll get future alerts. Scientific conversations continue at a Real Science Lecture Series of webinars. To get those, visit balchemanh.com slash real science to see all upcoming events as well as past events. And we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Mm-hmm.